Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for this exciting episode of OPG Live. I am Ian Plant. And I am Lilia Khalif. And we are here to present the next exciting episode of OPG Live. I feel like I'm being very redundant all, <laughs> all of a sudden. I want to thank you all for showing up. I want to uh, thank our sponsor, Tamron, for making mm -hmm. this event possible. And today we have an exciting event. I'm going to be sharing some photos from my recent photo trips to the Faroe Islands and to the desert southwest of Utah. And of course, I'll be here answering your questions as much as I possibly can. And I think we've got a few comments and questions we coming do. in so far. Yeah, I just want to let you know, ask your questions in the chat box right below this video. You, you'll see it. It's already big and open, and it has a blue outline around it. So drop your questions in the chat there. I'd like to read out that Lewis is already present in the chat. Hi, and Lewis. He said, I'll just give you a little shout out here, Ian. <laughs> I love Ian's videos and webinars. I think he rocks, don't you? So. Oh, well, thank you, Lewis. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, if anyone else likes what they're seeing, then please uh, feel free to chat. If you don't like what you're seeing, uh, I guess it's okay if you leave a comment as well. It just will make me sad. <laughs> That's just constructive criticism, <laughs> feedback. As long as it's constructive, I'm okay with it. Okay. So uh, I, you know, I'm always traveling. I always have exciting adventures. Some photo trips go better than others. I recently did a series of photo trips. I was in the Faroe Islands. As a matter of fact, our last live event was live from a gas yeah. station in the Faroe Islands. I was with my fellow photographer, Erez Marom, uh, and we did our live event there in a gas station after eating the famous uh, Faroese hot dogs that oh. you could buy in the gas station. Uh, <laughs> hot dog wrapped in bacon. You can find that, you know, these in North Norway and Iceland and other parts Iceland of Iceland also has a famous hot Yeah, dog. very famous uh, bacon wrapped hot dogs. So uh, I know that was not a, an exciting location. We wanted to host the event outside, but it was raining. Uh, but now we're back in the studio. So I had an exciting trip in the Faroes, uh, but it uh, wasn't really productive photographically, and that happens. Sometimes you go to a place, especially for a place like uh, anything in the North Atlantic, the weather tends to be very unpredictable. So I had a lot of bad weather. I didn't have very many great shooting opportunities, so didn't really make that many good shots. And when I was done with the Faroes, I was looking forward to a trip to photograph polar bears in the Canadian Arctic. And this is a trip I've been looking forward to a long time. I do like photographing polar bears. I've been up to photograph polar bears in Alaska three times in previous years, and I took a year off. So I was very excited to be going back. But as soon as I got back, I learned that there was a small problem. Oh. Well, there was this cold blast in the Canadian Arctic. So the sea ice came in three weeks early. Oh. And when the sea ice forms, the bears go on the ice and they disperse because they spend all winter hunting seals on the ice. So my, uh, my local guide called up and said, don't even bother coming out. <laughs> So I was very disappointed. Disheartening. Yeah, so I had a rough trip in the Faroes, and I had my polar bear trip canceled. So then what I needed was some comfort photography, kind of like comfort food. Yeah. You know, like when, when someone dumps you and you're sad, you sit there with a tub of ice cream. Well, for me, my, my proverbial tub of ice cream, photography speaking, is going to Utah to the high <laughs> sandstone desert, to one of my favorite places in the world, just to photograph. Uh, it's a really beautiful country. It's a really great experience down there. And I go into the, the no man's land that's kind of in between a bunch of the national parks there where there's barely anyone else there. So I have this beautiful wilderness all to myself. And it was a, a fantastic experience. And I've got some good uh, shots from that trip. Very productive. Hmm. It was the comfort photography that I needed. <laughs> Utah, who would have thought? That's yeah. comfort photography. <laughs> Well, you, you know, Utah is a stunningly beautiful state. Yeah, and it, it's a nice it, rock formation. It, yeah, very nice rock formations. And, uh, you know, uh, some people say that I rock. Well, Utah really rocks. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice tie in there. Yes. Yeah, so I, uh, I, unless we've had any questions that have come in so far. Not quite yet. Um, Start that, asking your questions. Yes, definitely. You know, I mean, this is your chance to pick the brain of a professional photographer. And I realize that my brain's a little weird. Uh, <laughs> but generally, you know, I, I've got a lot of weird things to say. But generally, the photo advice I give is pretty solid. So I will uh, dive in to, to share some of the photos from my recent photo trips. And we're going to start off with uh, just a few of the, the shots that I got in the Faroes that were OK. So this was the very first day that I arrived. So it's a red night, red eye flight overnight. So I didn't really get that much sleep. And I show up, and my luggage is not there. It's missing. And it's going to take oh, a whole no. day for it to arrive. It got stuck in Copenhagen. Down so, Copenhagen. yes, I had my photo equipment with me, but I didn't have my tripods. They were in my checked luggage. And because I've got all my photo equipment that I carry on with me, I don't have a lot of space for other items. So I didn't really have 
any of the warm outdoor clothing that I typically have along with me on a photo trip. So for this very first day, went up with uh, my buddy Eras to this high mountain and we get up there and it's snowing and it's very, very windy, it's very cold. And so I'm out there in you know not enough equipment to stave off the wind and the cold. So I'm freezing my tuchus off while I'm out there. <laughs> and um, uh, it, it was kind of nice because the, uh, there had been a lot of clouds and a lot of uh, rain and snow that day, but they were beginning to break a little bit on the western horizon where the sun was going down. So we had a little bit of light breaking through on this very beautiful mountain overlooking this scenic fjord. And even though I was absolutely miserable, because we had light breaking through, my rule is if you've got good conditions, then you're out there, you're out there shooting, trying to make it work no matter how miserable you are. So if you're getting bitten by bugs, or if it's really freezing cold or anything like that, as long as conditions are good, I'm willing to put up with it. If conditions aren't good, then I head back to the hotel, head back to the hotel bar specifically <laughs> to get some comfort. Uh, some uh, actual comfort yeah, food. Yes, some actual comfort food and some comfort drink as well. So even though I was miserable, I was up there. Now, unfortunately, the light never really quite broke through the right way. You can see there's a little bit of light on the bottom of the mountain, but the top of the mountain never left the clouds. And it would have been a much better photo if I had gotten some light on the top of the peak. This is an important rule of thumb when you're making mountain photography is that you usually want the best light to be at the top of the peak. And if you don't have the, the top visible, if it's in the clouds or there's not light on it, uh, you can still make some good shots, but I think that's the moment you really want to wait for is to get that stunning sunset or sunrise light, that last light or that first light of the day on the top of the mountain peak. So this is not a bad shot. Almost made it there, but not quite. Now, after that, I had several days in a row where just rain and poured it was miserable conditions. <laughs> Didn't have any luck with the photography. Spent a lot of time exploring. Uh, then one day we went to this remote island. We had to take a helicopter over to this island and the island's only got about 20 or 30 houses on it. And mostly it was empty. There was maybe, I don't know, five or 10 people in the village uh, still there. Most of the people had left, uh, didn't want to be there in the winter. And so we had the whole island practically to ourselves. And uh, it was really nice. We did a hike. We went out to the edge of the island where there's a lighthouse. And the winds died down. And the clouds started to break up. And we started to get some nice light in the afternoon. So we started flying our drones, looking for interesting perspectives, a way to capture the beautiful cliffside scenery that all these islands in the Faroes have cloud, or sorry, have uh, cliffs that ring them. And they're very difficult to photograph unless you're out over the water. So with the drone, you can get that perspective and you can capture those cliffs. So I flew the drone off the island, looking back towards the island, towards the lighthouse that it was at the very tip of the island. And I got lucky with some sunset light breaking through and some nice clouds to help complete the composition. So this is probably the whole week and a half that I spent in the Faroes. This is probably the best shot that I got there. I didn't have much luck otherwise. The weather wasn't so great. So uh, I left the Faroes. I was pretty bummed out. And after the polar bear debacle, uh, I was speaking with my good friend Zach Mills, another one of uh, the OPG contributors who has been with me on previous OPG live events. And we were scheduled to go meet in the Canadian Arctic to photograph. That trip got canceled. So we said, well, what the heck? Why not fly down to Utah, <laughs> get into the canyon country, and just have a splendid time? Now, this particular area that I go to happens to be in this this vast no man's land that's in between Canyonlands National Park and Capitol Reef National Park. There's uh, maybe about 100 miles of desert in between those two parks. That's all just BLM, Bureau of Land Management land. So it's, uh, it's public land, um, but it doesn't have the regulations that the national parks have. So it's a place where you can fly your drone. And it's a great place for the drone because there's no one there. Uh, so I'm not bothering anyone. I don't like flying it, my drone, when there's other people around. I don't want to bother people who are trying to have that desert solitude, that wilderness experience. So I can go into some of these places here where there's no one around for miles, and I can do the photography I want to do. I can either fly my drone, or I can do photography based on the land. And the landforms here are incredible. There's a lot of these eroded badlands. You've got various different kinds of sandstone. You've got these uh, clay, these bentonite hills. You've got the red Navajo sandstone that uh, is sculpted by the water and creates these beautiful slot canyons. So there's a lot of texture to this landscape and there's a lot of color to this landscape. So it's really great at sunrise and sunset on a clear sunny day. If I'm on the land and it's very clear out, if I don't have any clouds to complement the scene, I'm not 
usually interested in doing land-based photography, but with the drone getting a slightly higher perspective, you can play with the interplay of shadow and light uh, and, and see all the shapes and the colors that emerge from this, and you can get some really great creative shots. So just getting that little bit of a higher perspective a few hundred feet above the ground allows you to explore a lot of compelling and unique compositions that most people aren't photographing. So this is one example of that. These are these eroded clay badlands, and they're uh, yellow in color. And when you have that first uh, uh, ray of light in the morning or the last rays of light in the evening, they take on a very warm color in that, that sunrise or sunset light. And everything that's in shadow beneath them will take on a bluer tint because it's getting light only from the blue sky reflecting light down into the shadows. So you get this really interesting contrast of colors. And you get all these shapes and patterns and textures that emerge from the interplay of light and shadow. Um, here's another example. You know, the, the one thing I love about the shooting with the drone is that it's kind of like uh, an infinite tripod. You know, I, I hmm. bet we've all struggled with trying to get a tripod in position. And sometimes getting it into that perfect position can be really challenging and really tricky. And the drone, you can pretty much position it just about anywhere uh, in a way that you can't do with the tripod. So you can get some really interesting perspective, perspectives that are difficult to get from land-based photography. So for this shot of a small bush growing in this uh, vast swath of cracked mud, I was only, I don't know, maybe five, seven feet above the ground. So I wasn't that much higher than I could have gotten with my tripod. With a, it was a perspective that I could have achieved with a tripod with a wide angle lens. But the problem was if I had the camera on the tripod, or even if I was hand holding it looking straight down with a wide angle lens, the tripod, my feet, my legs, all of that would have been included in the shot. So I was able to remove myself from the shot and hover the drone right over the scene to capture this composition, to capture the pattern and the interplay of the colors in this scene. I'm going to interject a relevant yeah, question here. Sure. Joe is asking, what camera do you have on your drone? So the drone has a camera built in. Mm -hmm. uh, so the drone I'm flying right now is the DJI Mavic 2 Pro, which has a 20 megapixel camera. And it's a one inch sensor. So it's not as big as a full frame or a crop sensor camera that you are used to using on your DSLR. Mm -hmm. A little bit smaller of a sensor. Uh, but with 20 megapixels, you're still getting really good quality. And the thing you have to worry about with these smaller sensors is not, they don't really have less quality than the bigger sensors, but they do often have more digital noise. So if you're using higher ISOs, or if you're not properly exposing the files, that noise will, that noise will become much more apparent and it will diminish overall image quality. So if you can keep the ISO down, if you can control the noise, you can actually get some really great image files out of this. That'll blow up really nicely to a 24 by 36 inch print or maybe even a little bit, a little bit bigger. So. All right, good yeah. answer. Fantastic Continue thoughts. On. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and you know, once again, please send in your questions. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can I during the event. I do have some more in the chat, but I was going to save them for the end because they're a little less relevant to the photos. Would you like a few more questions well, right now? Well, that's okay. If we have questions that are relevant to the things that I'm talking about, we'll dive in right now. The rest of the questions that might be more general, we'll save for the end All of the right. general discussion. So. Uh, going back to the photos, uh, so I'm always I'm always looking for the textures and the patterns and the colors and finding a way to bring it all together to form a pleasing composition. And uh, another thing that I you know when I'm if it's a sunny day at sunrise and sunset, I do like flying the drone because you can work with the shadows and the light. And if if in the middle of a sunny day, another thing you could do when you're in canyon country is to go deep into the canyons, especially if you've got slot canyons because those are going to be best photographed on a really bright, sunny day. You don't want a lot of direct sunlight coming into the canyon because it'll create a lot of bright hot spots and too much contrast. But when you have parts of the canyon that are glowing very brightly in that bright sunlight on a sunny day, they will act like giant reflectors and they will bounce that light deeper into the canyon. And that reflected light that makes its way down when it hits that sandstone creates that beautiful colorful orange glow that, that slot canyons are famous for. You can see it in this photo here. This is a small canyon called Leprechaun Canyon, which is a fun little slot canyon that you can get into. And it's got a really charming name. <laughs> uh, so it's a lot of fun. I did not find a pot of gold at Shame. the, uh, yeah. But uh, it, is, it is a beautiful little canyon. And I was able to take advantage of this, um, of this bounce, this reflected light 
creating that orange glow in the background. So I set up a wide angle composition to use the leading line that goes into the scene. It draws the viewer deeper into the composition. And then I decided I needed to add a human element to complete the composition. And naturally, I picked myself because <laughs> I was the most attractive person I was with at the time. <laughs> so, so you were with no one. I was alone, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also look much better when I'm just a small little blue dot in Far the background away. of a composition than I do when you can see my actual face. Better I, uh, at a distance. Yeah, much better at a distance. Uh, they say that I have a face for radio. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'd be perfect for a podcast. <laughs> but, um, so what I did is I set the 10 second timer and I triggered the shutter and with the 10 second delay I ran into position and I, there was some trial and error to get it right before I found the right position and the right pose. I wanted to have a, an active and very manly pose, so I chose this dynamic, I'm taking a photograph oh. uh, pose, yes. So, But it helped to tie the whole composition together. Sometimes having that human element, you, you, know, you want to use uh, visual elements that will push the viewer deeper into the scene so leading lines will help push the viewer in, but if you have something in the background that pulls the viewer in, this helps heighten the effect. So having a human element is one of those elements in the background that can pull the viewer deeper into the composition. So I'm always thinking of ways to direct the viewer's eye, to create an artistic composition, and to create visual energy to get the viewer's eye excited and trapped within the composition for the long run. All right. All right. Is so, that all your photos? No, I have oh, some more. I do. You made indeed. it sound like that was final. No, no, <laughs> no. I just wanted it, it seemed like a natural pause, uh, uh, but it uh, reminds me of a joke. Tell your joke. A bear walks into a bar okay. and uh, orders a drink, and the bartender says, No, oh, wait, I've already, I've already messed up the joke. <laughs> The bear, well, I can't help you there. The bear walks into the bar okay. and it says, Bartender, give me a whiskey. And the bartender says, why the big pause? Oh. Get it? <laughs> Sorry, it's not a very good joke. All right, well, back to the photos. That's the only thing I'm good at is talking about photography. Uh, all right, so this is deeper into the canyon. And um, uh, this was in the narrowest part of the canyon. So Leprechaun Canyon narrows to this very narrow slot. And the farthest you can go uh, without doing any technical uh, canyoneering is this narrow bit of a slot. Beyond that, the slot gets even more narrow. It's so narrow that you got to know what you're doing to get through it, and you really can't be carrying any photo equipment. So this was deeper into the canyon. Now, I jokingly said earlier that I didn't find my pot of gold, but that's not entirely true. <laughs> so when the sun passes over this very narrow slot canyon, for mm -hmm. a few minutes, a beam of light makes its way all the way down to the bottom of the canyon floor. And when that beam hits the sand at the bottom of the canyon, that sand glows so brightly relative to the rest of the canyon, which is deep in shadow, that it actually reflects that light onto the canyon walls. Mm. So the end result is this very warm, colorful look. It looks like it's on fire from within. It almost looks like there's a bright, shiny pot of gold right there in the middle of Leprechaun Canyon. So I go. found my pot of gold in this shot. Nice. Yeah, nice. definitely. <laughs> um, so I went into the canyons whenever I got a chance during the day, and then I would make sure to be someplace interesting at sunrise or sunset. Uh, and when I was flying my drone, I'd be looking for interesting use of shadows. I think you know shadows are something that are, are really great to incorporate into your photography. They can help create patterns. Uh, but they could also become the subject of your composition in and of themselves. So for this particular shot, there was this mesa in the distance, and I flew my drone out to it. And then I got my drone above the mesa looking down, and I was able to photograph the shadow receding away from the mesa. So the mesa and the shadow became the basis of my composition, forming this nice dynamic triangle shape. And it only is something that you can capture when you start thinking about the shadow creatively as a shape, as a compositional element. So the shadow is something that, you know, it, it creates a shape that isn't really there. So the shape isn't natural. When the shadow is gone, the shape doesn't exist. So the shadow only exists because of the interplay of areas of light and areas of darkness. And so using these shadows creatively as compositional shapes can really take your photography to the next level. But you have to learn to think in the abstract to see these opportunities. 
you know, as I said, this is a very colorful landscape. And in some places, mm -hmm. it's ridiculously colorful. So this is a little spot that I found. I do a lot of scouting. And one thing that helps me when, I, when I'm scouting is to look at satellite maps. Oh. So I can see what the landscape looks like from above. And it's pretty easy to access satellite maps and things like Google Earth. Or you can go into all of the mapping programs that are available online or on your smartphone. They usually have an option. You can switch over to a satellite view. And that satellite view gives you a really good feeling for the texture and colors of the landscape. So this was a little spot that I found by looking at the satellite maps. And I liked the fact that there was all these colorful stripes. You can see that from the satellite pictures, all these beautiful, colorful stripes passing through the landscape. So I said, aha, this <laughs> is going to be a great place to photograph. And so I went there. There's good opportunities from the land here. Uh, also interesting opportunities with the drone. And I took this particular shot with my drone. And what I did is I waited for the sunset sky to uh, maximize the color on the clouds in the background. So when those clouds turned very pink, probably about, I don't know, five minutes after the sun set, they began to pink up and uh, to put the most color in the background, that's when I took the shot. So I could tie together the interesting color stripes in the foreground with the colorful sky in the background. So I went back to Leprechaun Canyon, Zach and I actually, we decided that it wasn't spooky and scary enough during the day. We wanted to go back there at night and check it out. And so, of course, uh, you know, have you seen the movie? I think it's, what, 128 hours? You no. know, the one James Franco is canyoneering and he gets trapped. He gets his arm trapped under a boulder. It's based on a true story. Mm -hmm. And the poor guy. This is lost on me. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> so like. He gets, okay, arm caught under a boulder. Yeah, and he okay. can't get, the boulder falls on his arm and he's trapped and he's in this canyon in the middle of the desert mm -hmm. in nowhere. And this is a true story. Oh. And uh, after 128 hours, he, he, he's afraid he's going to die there. So he takes out a pen knife and he saws through his arm to his arm. Pretty oh, much, okay. yeah, yeah. So whenever I'm canyoneering, uh, I always think of this movie. And, uh, <laughs> Do you bring a coping saw with you to make the process easier? <laughs> I, I don't think I could cut through my own arm. Mm -hmm. I just don't think I could you do it. You never know, I, 120 hours. Hours. What true, do to you? true. You know, at that point, you're probably just hallucinating. <laughs> but um, it's a really, it's a great movie, uh, and it's what, what's so great about it is that it's shockingly true. But if you're going to explore any slot canyons, don't watch that movie before you go. <laughs> especially like, not before you go at yeah, night. Yeah, just maybe. yeah, especially not at night. Um, especially also if there's going to be boulders featured in your slot ca canyon mm -hmm. photography, because you're always going to be thinking, is that boulder about to fall on my arm? <laughs> is that the boulder? Yeah, the boulder that yeah. will kill me. Best thing you can do to avoid getting trapped alone in a slot canyon for days where you're forced to eat your own foot to escape or something like that is bring a photo buddy along. There you go. Yeah, and it's always a good idea whenever I go photograph dangerous wild animals, I bring a photo buddy along if I'm going Push into... Push the way, out of the way. So well, you have someone to take the fall or the attack before they come to you. You don't have to outrun the polar bear. You just have to outrun your slower, yep. tastier friend. There that is my governing philosophy. So that way, if you do get your foot or your arm trapped somewhere, someone else can go and find help. So you don't have to, you know. Saw it off. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> But when I'm in this canyon at night, that's all I can think about is that movie. So <laughs> we, we decided Pleasant to go thoughts. in. Yeah. You know, and part of interest, making interesting photographs is figuring out ways to photograph things different from the way that everyone else does. So mm -hmm. it's conventional wisdom to photograph a waterfall on a cloudy day. But what if you go back there on a sunny day at sunrise or sunset? Try to do it in a different way that it's being done before. So slot canyons are the kind of things that people photograph on sunny days in the middle of the day. So why not check it out at night when the moon's up? And so it was a different opportunity. So for this particular shot, I went into one of the wider parts of the canyon and went very, very wide so that I can incorporate a lot of the sky in the background and the full moon that was passing overhead. And so I, once again, I was thinking about the leading lines and I had the, this uh, erosion pattern in the canyon at the bottom of the canyon floor that snaked its way through deeper into the composition. There was a nice boulder that had fallen there. Uh, that was precariously balanced, looking like he was just ready to fall again and trap someone's arm. And so even though a lot of the scene was being lit by the moonlight, uh, I used a flashlight to bounce some light onto the boulder so that that would balance. Otherwise, the boulder was in shadow because the moon was behind it. And I incorporated the moon as an element of the composition in the center from left to right at the top of the image frame. And because I had a 30 second exposure to capture all of the, the faint moonlight that was down there, um, the, the moon has this beautiful starburst effect. 
Uh, so it's kind of like if you're shooting during the day and you've got the sun in your shot with a wide angle lens, you can get that sunburst effect. The moon does the same thing. And during a long exposure, as the moon moves a little bit, it makes that starburst look even more pronounced than you would get if you're shooting during the day. So that was the composition I chose here. Uh, luckily, uh, no one got trapped. No one had to eat their own foot or saw off their arm. Everyone got out okay. So I recommend everyone check out 128 days. Just don't do it right before you go to photograph a slot canyon. Just like right before I was supposed to go up to the Canadian Arctic, I watched this mini series on AMC called The Terror, okay. which is a bunch of British explorers in the 1800s who get trapped. They're trying to find the Northwest Passage through the Arctic. They get trapped, and this giant polar bear monster attacks them and oh. eats them all. And I'm like, right before I go up to photograph the polar bears, that's just brilliant. <laughs> they have nightmares about this the whole time. This is, what, is this maybe an adrenaline-seeking sort of habit you have here, <laughs> just to get yourself pumped up for the great shots? No, it's just bad movie <laughs> luck, you know? Bad choice. Yeah, bad choice in, in what I watch before I go on these trips. So okay. I'm going to Mongolia in, uh, in February. Somebody recommend a Mongolian horror film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something getting about trampled by horses. Something about a young, you know, a photographer who goes there and gets, uh, you know. Were you going to say a young photographer? I know. I, I, I still, well, so the problem mm -hmm. is, I, even though I'm obviously no longer a young photographer, I still think <laughs> of myself as young because I haven't really matured. I, I still act no. like a five-year-old. Immature photographer. Yeah. I, I, in, in immature photographer gets, like, eaten by an eagle or something okay. while in Mongolia. Yeah. Back to the photos. <laughs> I try to keep this lively and entertaining so that uh, everyone's having a good time. So I want to mix, humor. yes, mix the education with some entertainment. Mm -hmm. So back to the photos. Uh, this is a shot I made. This is a, a, a big butte, a mesa, if you will. I've always, I never can say the word butte without giggling a little bit. <laughs> uh, so it's a mesa. It's very, there's a lot of these beautiful mesas that stick up in the desert. And uh, they're great to photograph, but the trick, as always, is to find something that leads the viewer's eye into that background scenery. If you're just zooming in and photographing the background scenery, your shots aren't going to be as effective. But if you have something to put in between you and that background subject, that foreground, that is when you create a much more compelling visual design. So I was photographing this beautiful mesa. It was a gorgeous sunrise. There was lots of great clouds. And I was flying my drone. Just because I was a few hundred feet off the air with my camera with the drone doesn't mean that I can't be thinking about foreground. When you're on the ground, foreground is the stuff that's literally at your feet. But even when you're shooting something that's farther away, it's really just finding something to put in between you and your subject to help lead the viewer there, to extend the viewer's journey and create more visual excitement. So here, I use these long ridge lines. Now, the drone camera only shoots in horizontal format. So how do I get a vertical shot? Well, I could just you know, move back with the drone and shoot the horizontal and then crop it to vertical. Or you can vertically pan the camera while you're taking shots and then stitch those shots together to form a vertical panorama image. And that's what I did here. So I uh, basically had to preview my composition by panning the camera up and down so I knew where I wanted to start and where I wanted to stop. And once I figured out the composition, made sure that I was going to have these beautiful leading lines leading the viewer's eye into the scene, I panned through, took several shots, and then I used the merge to, eight, uh, the merge to panorama feature that you can find in Adobe Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. Pretty easy to stitch images together as long as the trick to stitching is that you want to have some overlap between each of the photos so it'll make the stitching process easier. Mm. Yeah. So I was able to turn a horizontal shot into a vertical stitch as a result and incorporate those beautiful leading lines. So I think we have a, let me see, we have a few more photos. All right. Yes. Uh, well, here's another slot canyon. The previous canyon was Leprechaun Canyon. This is called Little Wild Horse Canyon. And I've been in this canyon a few times. And what's amazing about these places is they always change. So the last time I was in uh, Little Wild Horse Canyon, uh, you could see the bottom of the canyon. And there was a little bit of sand on the canyon floor. This time, there must have been like three feet of gravel that was at the bottom of the canyon. So you can no longer see the canyon floor. There must have been a flood that brought in a lot okay. of sediment, and it completely changed the, the look of the canyon. It was really uh, remarkable to see how different it was. Hmm. And uh, it made things a little bit difficult. Some of my favorite parts of the canyon to photograph, you couldn't photograph anymore because the gravel was covering everything up. So for this particular shot, this was a little bit uh, uh, farther down uh, towards the bottom of the canyon. And it's a narrow part of the canyon. 
And to get this perspective, I actually had to climb up the cam canyon wall. So I was stemming my way up. I had my oh. arms and my legs out. <laughs> Uh, and they call this you could they call this uh, stemming mm -hmm. or they call this chimneying. So I was chimneying my way chimneying? up. Chimney. Oh, chimneying. Like like yeah. Santa Claus going up or down a chimney. Except Santa Claus doesn't just wiggle his nose and magically fly up or down. <laughs> He's got to like actually you know use it's friction to yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So here I am using friction to climb up this wall. I'm about ten feet up and I got my tripod set up above me and this and of course it's precarious having the tripod set up because you have to splay the legs out and find a way to stick them into parts of the wall where it's not going to just slide down yeah and uh, so and I'm doing the same thing I'm like holding on for dear life to keep from falling down and I'm trying to take this shot Interesting. and there was this woman who was coming up hiking up the canyon <laughs> and she wanted to take a photograph and she didn't realize I was there so like so she heard she heard my you know me and Zach talking and she was waiting for us to move so she could take her picture and I'm waiting for her to move and you know, so we're a bit of Still an impasse. Made. And finally, I'm like, "Hey, lady, I'm, I'm like, my arms are falling asleep here. <laughs> can we, uh, can we negotiate this?" And she's like, "Oh, I didn't realize you were there, you know." And I was like, "Yeah, well, I, I'm, you know, if you come up and I can take my picture that I was set up here for, and then when I'm done, I'll get down and you can do whatever you want. We'll get out of your way." So we worked it all out, but it was, uh, it was rather awkward for and a while. An opportune yeah. time, for sure. Yeah, but definitely. I'm always looking for opportunities to get a different angle, a better perspective, and I'm always looking to find those great compositions. So if I have to sacrifice my body for my art, uh, it really. You're ready and willing. Well, I mean, you know, no one really wants anything to do with my body anyway. So like, you know, it, you know, donate it to science. Everyone will be but happier. Here, here's the, you're willing to climb a wall, but you won't saw off your own hand if it gets fallen on a boulder I'll, you won't sacrifice your body in that way I will saw off my old hand my own hand for a good photograph okay but not no, to photograph. not to not save to my save own life. life yeah that's okay. where I draw the line that's the line all right <laughs> Uh, moving on to the next photo, there's this, uh, this other mesa that I found driving around in the in the back roads, these uh, these dirt roads. A lot of them are four by four trails, uh, and I found this mesa with this. Uh, it's actually called Family Butte. Hmm. I guess it's because it looks like a family. You know, there's a family of buttes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's a kind of looks to me it looks like a hand butte or maybe like a turkey butte, but I guess someone first saw it, thought it looked like a family of people standing sure. together. So. It's a pretty interesting formation, uh, and I used my drone to photograph it, and I, I went there first to sunset, and there were some nice clouds in the sky, so I got the drone in position to find a nice arrangement of visual elements to work with that, that, you know, that beautiful sunset sky. But the next morning, I came back at sunrise, because mm -hmm. that's when the really good, strong light was going to strike the, the best part of the butte. And I waited for the light to get up high enough so that it was strong enough so that if I exposed only for the sunlit parts of the shot of the scene, the rest would fall deep into shadow. So the end result is that the sunlit view just pops out from that black background. And this is a way you can take advantage of the technical limitations of your equipment. I think a lot of people are frustrated by the limitations that their equipment offer, offers. And everyone's always trying to extend the dynamic range of their shots and things like that. So you've got HDR and all this stuff to get around these technical limitations. But I like to embrace those technical limitations. The limited dynamic range of digital cameras can be very powerful if you photograph something that's very brightly in the light and there's enough contrast in the scene everything else in shadow will fall into silhouette and having that sunlit subject popping out from that dark black background is very vivid very graphic and can be very powerful photographically speaking nice i think right. that's it we're through all our photos we're through ready all the photos some questions? i am ready for some questions okay keep asking them in the little chat box <laughs> below this you'll see a bunch of questions in a little blue box, and I'll keep asking them for as many as we have time for. And remember, the, the better your question is, the smarter your question is, and the funnier your question is, the more, the likely, more likely we're going to read it here on the air. <laughs> All right. Our first question is from Wally D, who asks, Ian, are you a fan of circular polarizing filters? Uh, thank you, Wally, for joining in on our chat, and thank you for your great question. Um, so the different, what a circular polarizer is, is it's a specific type of polarizer. And I'm not an optics expert or a physician or, or no, physics guy. I'm not a physician either. Uh, <laughs> so I don't really understand all this stuff. But the difference between um, the two different types of polarizers are circular and linear polarizers. Mm -hmm. 
And a circular polarizer doesn't mean that it's round. You can have a, a square filter that's circular or linear. It's just the way it polarizes light. So a linear polarizer is a traditional polarizer that was used by photographers before the invention of modern autofocus and modern uh, through the lens exposure systems. A circular polarizer is designed to work with modern autofocus systems. So you can autofocus through the lens even if it has a polarizer on it. So a linear polarizer, if you're not doing any autofocus, uh, then, a, then a linear polarizer is fine. And the linear polarizers tend to be a bit cheaper. Uh, it's only if you're planning to focus through the polarizer that you have to worry about having a circular polarizer. So um, I guess I'm a fan of the circular pol polarizer when I need it. I'm not sure I would call myself a fan. I don't think I'd be out there you know, rooting for the circular <laughs> polarizer. Actually, the funny thing is, uh, for the most part, I have used linear polarizers mm. throughout my career because I've never needed them. When I'm shooting landscape photos and I'm using a polarizer, I almost always just focus manually using hyperfocal distance focusing. So I'm not autofocus focusing with my polarizer filter, so I've never needed a circular polarizer. So I've been perfectly OK with a linear polarizer. So I guess, in a way, I'm a linear polarizer fan. So All right. yeah, but that's the difference. Uh, you know, if you have any question about it, if you're not sure which one to get, the circular polarizer is the one that's going to work with all of your modern equipment, no matter what you do with it. But if you know exactly what you need, uh, and you know you don't need a circular polarizer because you're not using autofocus, then a linear polarizer is just fine and will save you some money. All right. Our next question, you talked about this a little bit when you were talking about the satellite feature of checking out places you're mm -hmm. going to visit. And Ken asks, how do you determine your itinerary for your trips, and how do you know the best places to visit while on those trips? Oh, Ken, that, that's a very great question. And I get this question a lot. People want to know how to plan these trips. And I do a lot of research ahead of time. I, I want to know what the area has to offer. I, I try to avoid looking at other people's photos too much. Mm -hmm. Like I might look at like tourist photos. If you go to Google Images and you search for stuff, almost always you end up getting a lot of just tourist snapshots. And those yeah. I don't mind looking at because they give me a good idea of what the scenery looks like. But when you start looking at other really serious photographers and the work they've done there, it kind of poisons the well. Mm -hmm. You see those great shots, and that's, that's all you want to do at that yeah. point. It sticks in your head. And I'm trying to have my own creative vision. But certainly doing a lot of that research ahead of time, figuring out where the interesting landforms are going to be, uh, and getting an idea about what the scenery actually looks like before you go, that's a good first start. And I usually come up with a bit of a shot list. You know, Some of the places I want to check out, and I will mark them on like Google Earth or on a, on a GPS map so that I can go and find those places. But I try to stay flexible. And the key thing is when I take a photo trip somewhere, I try to spend as much time in a specific location as I possibly can. Mm. I think a lot of people make the mistake of planning a photo trip, hitting a bunch of different places, yeah. and going one day to a place, staying overnight, then going another day to the next place. And yet it just ends up being run and gun. And that's a bad idea. When I go to a place, I will try to spend a week or two weeks at that place because it takes a lot of time to start exploring the area. You can get an idea about what you want to photograph, um, but as long as you're, you're looking for unique and personal compositions and you're not just trying to like uh, knock off a shot list of, of what other people have done, it takes time to get there on the ground, boots on the ground, explore your options. So I personally remain flexible. I know if an area looks like it's got a lot of potential, I'll try to spend as much time as there as possible. Usually my, my rule of thumb is two weeks for an area. And when I'm there, I start exploring the places that I had researched ahead of time. And then I start pushing the envelope and exploring even more. Just get out there. Because sometimes you just have to see what an area has to offer. And then I start creating a mental checklist of all the areas that I think might be good for different types of photography. And usually I'm dividing them into good sunrise spots and potentially good sunset spots. And that really depends on which way the land form, the land feature faces and where the sun in, uh, is rising and setting on a, on a given day. So once I start developing the mental checklist, mm -hmm. I start working those scenes. And if I go and everything comes together, then I knock it off my list if I get the shot. But more often than not, you sometimes have to shoot the scene before you really can figure out the best way to bring that scene to life. 
So once again, this is where having that extra time, having that flexibility makes a lot of sense because a lot of these places that I photograph, I don't get them on the first try. Yeah. Usually what happens is I go there, like if I think a place is good for sunrise, I show up at sunrise and I see what happens. That way I see what the shadows look like. That way I see you know, how the interplay of light and shadow on the landscape, how that works. And sometimes I'd say to myself, you know, this shot's gonna work best on a bright, sunny morning. Sometimes I say this shot's gonna work best when there's uh, beautiful clouds that light up and the clouds have gotta light up in the right place. So once you figure out what is the best chance of getting a great shot, the kind of shot you wanna make, then it's just waiting for the landscape and for the light, for reality to catch up with your own artistic vision. So having that extra time to go back and shoot something more than once is absolutely critical to getting the shots that you want and to get the shots that are really gonna stand out from the crowd. So lots of planning, but most of all, lots of flexibility, mm -hmm. a willingness to get out there and explore. I usually spend most of the day in between sunrise and sunset exploring. So most of my time, most of the work that I put into my photography is just looking for interesting composition. So having that flexibility, having that dedication, and most importantly, having that extra time is absolutely critical. All right. Next question is from Wally mm -hmm. D who asks, is there such a thing as a perfect f-stop for close-up photography like flower and bugs? Ah, well, thank you, Wally. That is an interesting question. Uh, a perfect f-stop, mm -hmm. and the answer is 13. <laughs> Not <I'm> kidding. <laughs> Just there, pulling a number out of the air. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no perfect f-stop because, so what the f-stop controls, what the aperture controls, uh, these are the same thing. They're just, you know, f-stop is, is how you describe what aperture you're using. Basically, how big the, the opening of the shutter is when you open and close it. There's that little uh, diaphragm that closes and opens. It can be either like a little pinhole or it can go bigger. That controls how much light is coming through. This controls your depth of field, how much is in focus around your focus point. So when you focus on a point, only that point is focused. Depth of field extends that zone of apparent focus, making things in front of and behind of your focus point look increasingly in focus. So the more depth of field you have, the more that zone of apparent sharpness spreads beyond your focus point. So it depends on what you're shooting. When I'm shooting landscape, I want a lot of depth of field. I want everything from near to far to be sharply in focus. I want the entire scene to be completely in focus. So I'm often using a smaller aperture like f11 or f16, you know, shrinking that aperture to a small size. It lets in less light, but it extends that depth of field. If I'm doing close-up work, uh, macro work, it depends on what you want. Sometimes you want selective focus, like with wildlife or certain types of uh, macro shots. You want to focus on just one part of the overall composition, one subject in focus, and you want to throw the rest out of focus. So you want a very narrow depth of field. You're going to use a wide open aperture to reduce that zone of, of apparent focus. And if you're shooting you know, some macro scenes, some landscape scenes, you want everything in focus. You've got to extend that sharpness. And what that magic number is will also depend on how close you are to your subject, how cl close you are to your background. Uh, all these variables that come into play, it's incredibly complex and it's more than we can get into in this event. I encourage anyone who wants to learn more about achieving that perfect deep focus for landscape photography to check out my course, ebook and video course, Focusing for Landscape Photography, which is available on the OPG shop. Mm -hmm. It will tell you everything you need to know about hyperfocal distance, about depth of field, about plane of focus, about focus stacking, so that you get perfect focus each and every time. All right, check that out. All right. Our next question is from Norman, who asks, in the field, how do you decide which graduated filters to use when the sky is bright and the middle and the foreground are dark? Is it trial and error? Um, yes, it, it is a little bit trial and error. So a graduated filter, for those of you who don't know, is a filter that is dark on the top and clear on the bottom, and there's a transition between those two areas. And these filters are used to balance an exposure between a bright sky and a darker foreground. So at sunrise and sunset, for example, the landscape itself might be mostly in shadow, but you'll have that bright, colorful sky, you'll have the clouds that are lighting up. So to balance those two extremes, you pull the graduated filter down 
over the horizon, so you darken the sky, but you're not darkening the rest of the scene. This balances the exposure. And how much strength of graduated neutral density filtration you need will depend on how extreme that contrast is. Is. So usually, for most sunrise and sunset scenes, a two-stop graduated filter or a three-stop filter is perfect for you. But you may need more. If you're shooting into the light, like if you're shooting into the actual sunset, uh, the contrast range might be much more extreme. So you might need five stops. You might need to use two filters at the same time to get to that, uh, that number that you need. So a general rule of thumb is if the sun is you know, setting behind you and you're shooting a scene um, that is away from the sun, then usually a two-stop filter is enough to balance the sky, which might still be brighter, and the shadowed landscape. But if you're shooting into the light, you may need more. You may need five stops. So a little bit of trial and error, but understanding how it all works uh, will definitely help that trial and error be an easier process for you. There'll be uh, less error and more trial, I guess, <laughs> maybe less trial and error. So. All right, our next question is from Brian who asks, any rec recommendations for photographing quick moving animals or flying birds? I struggle with this. Yes, well, so there's a, there's a few things going on when you're photographing moving animals. First of all, the animal is moving fast. And so you wanna make sure you have a shutter speed that is high enough to capture the motion. And for running animals or for birds, that might be one 500th of a second or one 1,000th one of a second or maybe even higher. Like if you want to capture the uh, hummingbird uh, uh, wings, you're going to need a, a really, really high shutter speed. Uh, so it really depends on how fast the animal is moving and also the direction it's moving in. If it's uh, moving towards you or away from you, it's easier to get a sharp photo than if it's going from left to right, right in front of you. If it's really close, uh, that can be problematic as well. So these are all factors that come into play. But one 500th of a second is usually enough for most land-based animals to get them sharp. And one 1,000th for fast-moving birds is, is usually enough. Mm. The other thing that's going on is, of course, you might be moving. So you might be moving very quick, and you're introducing vibrations and movement uh, yourself. So you want to make sure, once again, you have a high enough shutter speed to reduce that. So usually, once again, that one 500th of a second or one 1,000th of a second is going to be good. The other complication is focus. You know, quite often, you've got the right shutter speed, but you're not getting your autofocus to lock on because everything's just moving too quickly. And the best thing you can do there is just practice, you know, especially when you're panning from one direction to, uh, to another. Uh, the autofocus isn't going to work that well if the subject isn't in the frame for the shots you're taking. So if you're kind of jerking around as you're doing this, you might find that when you're trying to autofocus, the subject isn't in the frame, isn't where the autofocus point is, and the focus locks on the wrong thing. So it takes some practice to move with your subjects to learn that fluid panning motion. Uh, what can help with that might be using a gimbal head. It's a type of tripod head that's designed to give you fluid movement with a long lens. So that can help, especially if your arms are getting tired, uh, to get a more fluid movement with your subject. But for the most part, I think you're going to find that the higher shutter speed is what you need to get those sharp images. And if your lens has image stabilization, that can help too. Uh, because as you're moving the camera around, tracking your wildlife subjects when it's moving, you're introducing that vibration and the stabilization will help minimize that. So these are things that you can do to make sure you get sharp wildlife images. All right. Our next question is from Archer who asks, I'm having an extremely difficult time with night photography, specifically with the moon as it sets over the ocean, usually around 2 to 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. or 12 to 1 a.m. I can seem to get an image that captures captures the ripples in the ocean in low light with the super brightness of a full moon. Without overlaying the two images on top of each other, how can I properly capture a full moon setting into the ocean at night time? Okay, so when you're shooting into a bright object like the moon or the sun, uh, you're going to have contrast issues. And it's going to make the shot difficult to capture. The contrast is a little bit less with the moon. So the moonlight is just reflected sunlight. So the, the sun is hitting the moon, it's glowing pretty brightly. Um, I guess the moon is, for the most part, gray rock, so it reflects very well. Um, and it's actually quite bright relative to everything else at night. So it's you know, kind of like it's the photographic equivalent of shooting into the sun on a sunny day. So um, one thing that helps reduce that contrast between the sun and the rest of the landscape or the moon and the rest of the landscape is shooting when the sun or the moon is low on the horizon. So when the moon's very low, it's 
the light's going to be scattered by atmospheric particles, it's going to reduce its intensity, and it's going to make it easier to capture that range. But still, in order to properly expose the moon, you're going to have to dramatically underexpose the shot. And that may mean that most of the scene around you goes into silhouette. Now, if the moon is setting over water, typically you can find an exposure that properly exposes the exposes the moon and still catches some of those reflections. The reflections are going to look a bit darker, but uh, you, sh you should still be able to get them, especially if that moon is right at the horizon and atmospheric particles are filtering the light and reducing its intensity. So you want to make sure, I think usually it's a good idea to make sure that the moon is properly exposed. You don't want it to be overexposed. And then let most of the surrounding sky and the water that's reflecting the moon go into silhouette and just have a hint of the reflected moonlight in the water. And I think that'll be a good way to try things. So just keep that in mind. It's really a contrast issue. Uh, you know, one way to solve it might be to experiment with a graduated filter or to do an exposure blend. Um, but I think that you'll find that you should be able to find a single exposure where the moon is properly exposed and you're still picking up some of those reflections. All right. Now we have some questions that are referencing some of the photos that we talked about earlier oh, today. Oh, fantastic. Back on the bottom. Right. Um, this first one says, from Don, in the night canyon shot, the boulder looks brighter than the canyon walls. Is that deliberate, or might you play with the flashlight timing, or change the brightness in the post-processing? Yeah, so let's uh, go back to that photo. Um, and it may just be, so OK, it, it is definitely uh, brighter than the walls in the background, because the walls in the background are in shadow. Mm -hmm. um, and so the moonlight was actually hitting the canyon floor where I was standing. So all of the canyon floor was uh, in that moonlight, and the walls in the background were in shadow. So that's why the walls are darker. And originally, the boulder was in shadow as well. So it was black, and you couldn't see it. It didn't separate visually from the black canyon wall behind it. So that's why I lit the flashlight on it. And what I was trying to do was, for the most part, match the exposure of the boulder to uh, the foreground that uh, was at the bottom of the canyon floor. So that's really what I was aiming to do. And I, uh, I made it just a little bit brighter than everything else to make it stand out a little bit more, to make it a more prominent part of the composition. But certainly, this is something that you can play with. And this is something that is uh, determined by individual taste, how bright, how dark you want it relative to the rest of the scene. For me, I wanted, I wanted that boulder to be an important part of the composition. And the important parts of the composition, if they're a little bit brighter, they'll stand out a bit more. So if you can wait for natural light to illuminate your subject in a way that makes it brighter so it's more prominent, or you can use artificial light to enhance its prominence, all of these things. And you can also do a little bit of they call it dodging and burning, selective lightening and darkening and processing of the image to make something stand out a little bit more or to tone it down a little bit more. But definitely, when you think about visual elements that draw the viewer's eye, anything that's relatively colorful and bright is going to draw the viewer's eye. So those should be important parts of your composition. All right, and I think this is our last question. Mm -hmm. This one is from Jim, who asks, on the image you stitched with the drone, did you keep the drone in one spot and pivot the camera up and down, or did you keep the camera in one, sp in one place and change the elevation of the drone, or did you move up and down a ladder? <laughs> <laughs> if I had a ladder that big, that would be fantastic. <laughs> so what I did is the drone uh, was in place, and so the camera can pan up or down, and Actually, it can pan quite far, so you can almost shoot directly above you, and you can shoot directly below you. So you've got quite a, a wide swath. You don't quite have 180 degrees, but it's impressive how much you can get. Mm -hmm. So the, the drone stayed in its exact position, and I very quickly uh, would pan the camera, take a shot, pan it, pan it, pan it. I wanted to do it as quickly as possible. The, drone, the drones are really good at staying in position, especially if there's not a lot of wind. Mm -hmm. They've got a GPS system on them, and uh, it's amazing how stable they really are. Uh, you, you learn how much the GPS contributes to keeping the drone in one place when your, G, when your uh, GPS module fails because your drone starts flying around like it's drunk, and which is really <laughs> hilarious. Uh, <laughs> it's confused or what? Yeah, yeah. Well, because the wind starts moving it around, ah, and so the mm -hmm. GPS actually keeps it in position. So the drone would stay in position, and I would just pan the camera through the various exposures until I had everything covered from the very bottom of the composition that I wanted to have at the end of the vertical stitch to the top. All right. So fantastic question. Thank you, as always. I think that's all we have time for. It is. Yeah. But thank you, as always, for your wonderful questions and for 
joining in to watch OPG Live. Thank you once again to Tamron for sponsoring this event. And remember, I'm here to help you become a better photographer. I'm hoping that my experiences, that my photos, that the tips and techniques I share with you will inspire you and help you become the best photographer you can be. So I'm looking forward to seeing you again during the next exciting episode of OPG Live. As always, I'm Ian Plant. I'm Lilia Khalif. And thank you very much for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.